everybody. So it looks like uh, we're live here. I think um, we have at least one person in the house. Yes. Hi, Deborah. Uh, thanks so much for joining me today. I'm going to try a little experiment here and try to um, go on Facebook uh, live at the same time um, because uh, at the moment I don't have the uh, activist um, sponsorship on Crowdcast to let us do what we did last week, which is to simultaneously broadcast on Facebook and YouTube, etc. And so um, while we wait for Crowdcast to have a look at our application, we're very hopeful that they will approve us as a um, pro bono uh, sponsorship for their wonderful services. It means that we can't um, live broadcast. But what I'm going to try and do is see if I myself can do a little bit of a live thing Oh, yeah, here we go. So here's on um, Facebook Live, rather not so great video quality compared to Crowdcast. But for those who are oh, actually better press live, that might help. So let me do that. So let's see. Hello, Facebook people. Hello, Facebook Live. Um, I'm doing a little experiment here where we're um, filming on Crowdcast and, and broadcasting for those who registered on Crowdcast and also on Facebook Live. And I'm hoping that um, we have um, people who want to join us can go to the Crowdcast website to register for this um, whole uh, hour of discussion on the right to health. We um, may or, or may not have time to uh, do the whole thing on, on Facebook Live. So if you're watching on Facebook Live, uh, hi Jenny, hi Yusuf. Um, Oh, apparently there's some problem with the video on Crowdcast, but I'm getting that fixed. So let's see if we can get that fixed. Um, all right, ho hold with me for one second to see if we can get this fixed. Um, is that repaired on uh, Crowdcast? Deb, can you let me know? Oh, and not great sound on Facebook Live. Okay, I think um, that might be because we're doing two things at once. Let's see. Is um. <laughs> How's that for the audio on Facebook Live? Is that a little bit better? Oh, good. Okay, much better. Excellent. Glad to hear that, Jenny. So hopefully um, that works with the audio on Facebook Live and getting set up on... Whoops. Oh. <laughs> wow, a bit of a disaster so far. But um, hopefully we're getting there. So just hold with me for one second. All right. Okay. So I think we have the audio on Facebook Live and I think we have the video on Crowdcast now. So for those who want the full experience, you can go to Crowdcast. To register on Crowdcast, it's um, www.crowdcast.io backslash e backslash global human rights with a hyphen in between global and human and human and rights uh, backslash register. And then, yeah, thanks, Jim, what a start. Yep, dropping the phone, no audio on one um, channel, no video on the other channel. But I think we finally got it sorted so that we do have um, audio and video everywhere. So we've got a couple of people joining us in um, Crowdcast and a few people uh, on Facebook Live, which I really appreciate. So I apologise if I'm kind of um, trying to, to look between the two different platforms at each time. But this is where we're at. So... Um, what we're going to talk about today is the right to health and the whole point of this webcast is that you can uh, ask any questions that you have. I've got some things that I can talk about and to um, uh, explain a bit about what we mean by the right to health, but I would love to hear your questions and that can guide us as to where we're going. Um, I have a wonderful helper, Deb, who is watching out for any comments that I miss because sometimes we miss some of the comments on Facebook Live. So I really appreciate that, Deb. Thanks so much. Uh, so if you have any comments or questions, things that you want to know about what is the right to health, what does it mean? One of the reasons why we picked this topic to do this month as our first um, uh, um, web uh, monthly discussion hour for the Global Human Rights Group is because of the timeliness in terms of what's happening in the US and all around the world with discussions about universal health coverage, health insurance, and what does um, it mean to have a, a political system which protects our right to health, particularly if we're talking about women's health, reproductive rights, all sorts of things like that. So that's what we're here to talk about today, the right to health uh, and all the different implications of that. I want to first of all start off with uh, introducing myself properly and telling you why we're here and a, a couple of disclaimers and things like that. So first of all, 
Uh, my name is Claire Mann. I'm the director of the Global Human Rights Group, and we're here for the first ever monthly um, discussion hour for the Global Human Rights Group. We're going to hold these every month on the third Thursday of the month at this same time, and you're free to join any month you want. Uh, the videos for this are going to stay online for a couple of days, for 48 hours, and then we're going to take them offline and they'll be available just to our sponsors, which is the right time for me to put in a little plug for um, our sponsors. I've got my list of things to talk about here. Um, thank our sponsors. So um, who are our sponsors? Actually, most of you all who are joining us. We um, are sponsored by people on Patreon, uh, which is a, a website for sponsoring uh, the work that people do. And um, we are sponsored by regular everyday contributors like you. Uh, and some people sponsor us for $5 a month, for other people for 20 or 30 or 100, whatever you can afford and whatever makes the most sense to you, everything adds up and helps us in the work that we do at the Global Human Rights Group to um, work with with up and coming human rights defenders and advocates and real everyday people trying to promote the message about what does human rights mean? How does it work and how does it apply to our real everyday lives? And for most of us, how can we incorporate human rights advocacy into our regular lives and into the, the things that we do in our communities? And for those who are really wanting careers in human rights, how can they get real practical experience in being a human rights advocate and doing the most that they can in terms of human rights advocacy? So that's what the Global Human Rights Group is all about. You can join us here every third Thursday for our discussion hours. And for those joining us on Facebook Live, I would actually say uh, join us on Crowdcast because this is where we're going to be doing all of our discussion hours and where the quality of the, the video and the sound is a little bit better here. So on the Facebook Live, um, Deborah Globus has very kindly put in the, the link in the comments to our Crowdcast. It's very easy to register and to pop on along there. So that's uh, who the Global Human Rights Group is, who I am. And um, now for a, a little bit of information um, about uh, what we're doing here. So the very first thing I have to do is give a couple of disclaimers. Um, I am a lawyer and the right to health is a legal topic, but uh, as most of you would be very uh, already understand well, uh, I'm not giving legal advice here. This is not um, uh, information that you should rely on and use in making legal decisions. What we're talking about is um, general discussions and questions about the right to health and the, the healthcare framework globally and in your countries. And we're looking at this from, from a perspective of answering your questions, not to give legal, legal advice. When I was thinking through the idea of these um, monthly discussion hours, I was thinking, why don't more nonprofits do this? Why don't more NGOs, non-governmental organisations that work on human rights issues have um, public forums which are open to the public um, in terms of being open online and easily accessible to all where people can join and uh, learn more about human rights topics. And then I remembered, um, well, first of all, we do have a lot of open forums for many NGOs hold um, expert meetings where they invite experts along and, and members of the public can come and join and, and hear all about it. But one of the reasons why these are often held as panel discussions or not necessarily recorded for prosperity so that they can be available online for a long period of time for everybody to watch and listen is because we're all afraid of not getting 100% right. Um, I'm volunteering to be on the spot here and to answer questions and to, to give my opinion and thoughts. But you may disagree with me. Uh, there may be uh, things that I talk about that you think that's too political or it's not political enough, it's too legal or it's not legal enough, and there may be things where you think um, you disagree or that you'd like to hear other opinions. And uh, my main disclaimer here is as an international human rights lawyer, I'm going to give you my views and my perspectives. These are not necessarily the same as everybody else's. Uh, they are not. Um, they're not. Uh, are not widely accepted, and they come from uh, work that's been widely published and accepted. But at the same time, um, there may be disagreements, and people uh, may not see the, the same way I do. So that's one of the fears about doing something like this: is that not everybody will agree, and I may not have all the answers to your questions that you have. So try and stump me. See if you can uh, catch. Uh, see if you can ask some questions which might. Um, be a bit more tricky and we'll see how we go with that. So please feel free to add comments and questions as we're going along. 
uh, I welcome um, interruptions and, and I welcome your comments to dictate where we go with this today. So let me give you a little um, beginning by saying um, where you can get more information. So to get more information about the right to health, there is a lot online. Sometimes weeding through it is a bit difficult and trying to figure out how do you understand this in relation to what's going on in your world? How do you understand this in relation to what's happening in your community? That can often be the key. So um, some colleagues and I uh, a few years ago edited a book called Realising the Right to Health. So this is where I do my here's what I prepared earlier. So this is book uh, and I realised that on your videos it, it kind of shows up the opposite way around. But that's a, a book called Realising the Right to Health. The chapters in this book we actually made freely available online so you don't have to go onto Amazon and buy um, an expensive book if you're interested in learning about particular topics. Uh, just get in touch with me and I can share you share with you um, the chapters that are available online. The main website for the, the project is no longer available but we still have the chapters that we can share with you. And in this book, we looked at all sorts of things like looking at a rights-based perspective to health and what this means, um, how to prioritise particular issues, for example, women's health, looking at groups at risk um, when we're thinking about the right to help to health. <laughs> there are many groups at risk that we can identify, like, for example, um, people in armed conflict, looking at the right to health in emergency situations. Um, looking at people in prison, uh, refugees and migrants, all these particular situations when the right to health might have um, particular needs and different consequences. And we looked at some of the, the key global human rights challenges, like looking at pandemics or um, the war on malaria, drug-resistant tuberculosis, those kind of things. Um, also some, some interesting things like non-communicable diseases, which are things like cancer and obesity, all these things which um, the, the, the world is, is um, that affects us all around the world. Um, and we also looked at how, what is the role of healthcare practitioners as well as governments and institutions like the United Nations in protecting the right to health and promoting a human rights-based approach to the right to health. So um, that's one, um, oh, we also looked at, sorry, the, the most important thing is solutions. We looked at strategies for how to promote the right to health and for realising the right to health. What are the different things that we can do? How do we do this through domestic courts? How do we do this through legislation? How do we do it through actually just being health practitioners? So that's one resource that if you want more information, I'd encourage you to go and have a look at um, and get in touch with me if you want any of those chapters. And um, I'll show you another um, resource in a second. First of all, I want to say hi to Suzanne and um, Alison. A big thank you to Alison for your comments about how any, um, everything we learn about the right to, or the more we learn about the right to help, the better. I totally agree with you. And hopefully you, you're going to learn some things today. And if you have questions, please um, stick them in the comments so that we can all um, uh, learn from the, the comments that you have. Another resource that's really useful, um, and not just about the right to health, but about all human rights, and for people who are not human rights experts, for people where, like most of you all, who don't know very much about law or human rights as a theoretical concept, but are interested in thinking about these things and thinking about how do they relate to the world around us, how do they relate to the, the communities which we are members of, is a, a very short introduction. It's an Oxford University Press, part of their very short introduction series, and it's just called Human Rights. Um, it's very easy to read. The second edition was published uh, a year or so ago, and uh, I was involved in helping on the first edition of this, and I was given a copy of the second edition yesterday, and I read it in one night. Um, it's uh, pretty quick and easy to read, very short introduction. It's deliberately easy. It's also really cheap. It's um, under ten pounds. I think it's about seven pounds or something. Yeah, seven ninety nine or eleven ninety five in the US. So it's a really affordable way of learning about human rights. The other thing that I'm going to uh, promote just before we get into the substance is uh, the course that the Global Human Rights Group is running called How to Stand Up for Human Rights. Uh, it's an online program. We're just in the process of uh, relaunching our, our, um, our revised first edition and, and taking participants for a second edition where we'll have much more interactive video participation uh, on how to use human rights in your advocacy that you're doing in your communities. So go onto our website and our Facebook page if you want more information about that. 
So in the absence of questions here yet, I'm going to start to talk about what is the right to health and um, what do we mean about the right to health? Why is it important? How does it, um, how does it relate to the, the worlds in which we're living? So um, what implications does it have for our insurance systems, for example? Alison, that's a great idea about adding the book titles and the authors here. Absolutely. In the Facebook comments, I will do that. So I'll do it as soon as I get off the, the video chat. I'll add that into the comments. Thank you so much for that reminder. So the right to health, what does it actually mean? I'll tell you the question that we get asked the most often, and that is, does it mean the right to be healthy? Is there such a thing as the right to be healthy? Could there be such a thing as the right to be healthy? The simple answer to that is no. The right to health in human rights terms does not mean the right to be healthy. Because if you think about it, that's actually physical impossibility for any entity, whether it's a government, whether it's an individual, a doctor or our communities, it's impossible for any of these entities to promise or to, to um, be able to fulfill on the promise of having everybody healthy. It's just simply not possible for everybody. So what it does mean, it's a bit of a long sentence. So I'll say it a few times that so you can really think about what the full implications are. The right to health actually is shorthand for what we call the right to the highest attainable standard of living. So let's think about that for a moment. The right to the highest attainable standard, sorry, what am I saying, standard of living? Well, this is what happens when you do it off the top of your head. The right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. So let's try that again. The right to health is just shorthand for the right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. So it's not about the right to be healthy. It's about the right to accessing the resources that we need, having available the healthcare systems that help us to achieve what is the highest attainable standard for each of us as individuals and for our communities as a whole. And it covers not just physical health, but also mental health. So that's what we mean when we talk about the right to health. We mean the right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. So that sounds great, but what does that actually really mean? Well, we can think about it in terms of access to healthcare, including the facilities of healthcare, like hospitals, doctors, surgeries, and things. It can include protection from uh, third parties that have an impact on our right to health. So that can include pharmaceutical companies, um, private healthcare providers, hospitals, doctors, etc. Um, and that that can include looking at things like protecting um, protecting via rules and regulations that govern the private parties, and it can also um, include thinking about not just those who uh, benefit from the right to health, so each of us as individuals and us collectively as members of a community, but also those that contribute to providing the right to health, so healthcare providers and those involved in the healthcare system. So why do we think about the right to health as being actually important at all? Why do we want to think about this from a human rights perspective? First of all, it's the law. The right to health is something that has been legally recognised by every country in the world in some form or another. So there's some kind of uh, law or rules, usually a treaty, an international treaty, which is binding legal obligations that governments have committed to imp implementing, that refer specifically to the right to health, which bind all of our governments to ensuring that we are all protected by the human rights perspective on health. So if we think about this, this um, began with the World Health Organization. In 1946, the World Health Organization's constitution set out health as a human right. So it's not just something which is this uh, lovely um, uh, concept, which uh, would be great if we could all have, um, but it's more of a charity-based approach. It's something that um, is a uh, um, desirable, but not necessarily a legal obligation in the same way the right to a fair trial or the right not to be tortured, those kind of things are. 
No, it is a human right that is on the same level, on the same par as issues like the prohibition against torture and um, the right to vote or the right to a fair trial, all of those kind of things. So when we think about people saying, well, the, the right to health is an aspiration, that in fact is not true. It's not just an aspiration. It's not an aspiration in the sense of that's all it is. And if we want to be charitable and if we want to have a good government that helps us, then they will look at the health from a, a rights perspective. No, the right to health is actually a legal obligation under international law and for many countries around the world under their national laws as well. So we see this in international treaties like the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights that protects the right to health. The Universal Declaration on Human Rights sets out an adequate standard of living and includes the right to health. And there are many different um, treaties at regional levels, like the American Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man, the American Convention on Human Rights, the European Social Charter, the African Charter, that all pr contain protections for the right to health. It's also recognised in more than 100 constitutions around the world and national courts all around the world have had the opportunity to adjudicate on cases to do with the right to health. Now, Antoinette asks a really good question about, okay, if it, it's a law, the right to health is a legal construct and it's something which um, binds governments to ensure that the right to health is actually implemented in our countries. But is our countries like the US legally able to withdraw funds from or abstain contributing to the World Health Organization, for example? And the answer to that kind of unfortunately is absolutely. Governments can decide what they do with their money, particularly when it comes to international um, contributions. So what we call um, international cooperation and assistance and participation in the multilateral community. Now, this is different to, yes, there's a legal obligation to implement human rights, including the right to health, at home within our own, uh, by our own government in our own countries, also contributing to that internationally through bilateral aid, as well as in the multilateral system, for example, in the United Nations and in agencies like the World Health Organization. So there are, and actually um, Mary helps to, to specify even more, but the, the US government in a sense can say, yes, we, we have decided not to contribute in the way that we previously have, to the United Nations or to the World Health Organization. That said, there's a certain amount of contributions which governments like the US have together agreed in the United Nations, these will not be, uh, th these will be compulsory contributions, which they all have to make as members of the United Nations. And so to back out of those contributions is like saying, well, we're backing out of the UN as a system and as a, a process of governance entirely. Now, what does that mean? I'm sorry, I'll just check what Mary's saying about this. Mary says that the US has obligations for assessed contributions, not voluntary contributions. So that's, that's that concept of when all the governments through the United Nations got together and said, we will all commit to funding to this amount, that's the amount which the US can't back out of in the sense of if they back out of that, they're backing out of part of that agreement of being a member of the United Nations. Um, and then... Uh, um, Mary also says that um, the US has a law that prevents funding if Palestine becomes a member of the United Nations organization. And uh, this is um, really interesting. I'm really pleased that, that Mary brought this up and uh, Mary is an expert on these things. She used to work in the legal section at the World Health Organization. So I really appreciate your help with this, Mary. Um, the organizations in the United Nations, the UN agencies and programs and funds and associated agencies, like the World Health Organization, are open to mem membership by governments around the world. And it's the members, the governments that are members of those organisations that get to decide what their rules are, what they're doing, how much money they're spending together, what happens to that money, and who else gets to join their club. And so the US has introduced domestic law that says if these particular countries, and in this instance Palestine, is accepted by the rest of the members of the club, then we're going to pack up our bat and ball and go home. And that's up to, that, that's the right of each individual country to do. That's part of what they're diplomatically allowed to do. But it's not um, something which uh, um, we hope every government does, certainly. We hope that other governments don't do the same thing. 
it's not something they've implemented yet. Um, and I think we'll just have to see what happens in terms of global health funding with the US's decision, not only about membership of the World Health Organization, but also about are they going to pull back on their voluntary commitments in terms of money, or are they also going to pull back on what they've committed to as part of what's called the assessed contributions, those are, um, are so-called compulsory parts of being part of the a membership of the United Nations. So that's the kind of long-winded answer to your question, Antoinette, about can the US stop funding the World Health Organization? And when we're talking here about the US in that con context, we're not just talking about the US, we're talking about every government. Every government is uh, a sovereign entity and has the ability to make decisions about what to do. So um, let's move on to thinking about um, what, uh, how, sorry, how is the concept of the right to health? How is looking at health from a rights perspective? What does it actually mean? What does it matter for the right to health? Sorry, for, for health and healthcare. Well, I'd like to think there are a few different ways in which uh, human rights are actually relevant to health. We've got the way in which when we're failing to protect human rights, this has a big impact on health. So it has adverse consequences for health. So for example, we can think about how imprisonment or torture or violations of the right to health, how all of these, and that's not to say imprisonment is itself a violation of human rights, but when you're being tortured or imprisoned in um, uh, bad conditions, which are violations of the right to health, violations of human rights, these can have an impact on your ability to enjoy the right to health. So human rights as a whole, protecting those or failing to protect those can impact on your health. We also have times when activities in the field of health may themselves violate human rights. So for example, um, when we have uh, instances of medical testing which go against our um, personal security and, and freedoms and these impact upon our, um, these are uh, issues, issues in the realm of health which impact upon our human rights. Uh, we also have examples like sterilization of the mentally impaired or forced medical procedures of any kind. Or what about instances like medical records not being um, kept in accordance with privacy laws? So these are instances where things that happen in the realm of health and healthcare impact upon uh, our human rights. Another aspect is when activities in the, the field of health um, can promote our, our um, human rights overall. So for example, um, keeping children healthy helps them to stay in school and therefore helps them to continue with enjoying the right to education. Same with adults and uh, the right to work and labor. So if we keep adults healthy, then they're better able to be continue to be con contributors to the, the um, uh, to the regular social system, ec uh, economic contributors, they're better able to enjoy the right to work. So if we're protecting uh, the right to health, if we're looking after the health uh, of people in society, that also promotes other human rights. And then the flip side of that is protecting human rights can also assist in raising levels of public health. So thinking about things like um, ensuring education, housing, the right to water and sanitation, all these things that are human rights, ensuring those actually leads to a higher level of health. And that actually touches on one of the really important things when we look at a, the right to health, which is the underlying social determinants of health. So things like our level of education, the level of access we have to education, to work and to good labor conditions, to water and sanitation, to adequate housing, even to participation in um, the democratic governance of a country, or um, so participation in terms of uh, the right to vote or in decisions that affect us in all sorts of realms of life. And um, civil rights, the, the knowledge that you have the right to participate in society without fear of um, being imprisoned um, for um, arbitrarily or being subject to an unfair trial, all of these things contribute to the health of the individuals and of our communities as a whole. So we see that there are some, some really interesting ways that human rights can impact on health and health can impact on human rights, both sides of, of that coin. 
Now, let's get into some of the nitty gritty. And so I'll just stop for a moment and say hello to all the recent people that have joined us. Um, I'm uh, enjoying the fact that we've got so many interesting people joining us here on Facebook Live as well as on Crowdcast. If you want to get a better view of what we're talking about, uh, registering on Crowdcast gives you better audio and a better video. Uh, so come join us there. If you um, scroll up through the comments, you'll see a, a link to our Crowdcast. So come join us there and please feel free to ask any questions or to make any comments you want. Um, I'm hoping that we can uh, get to uh, um, answer all the questions you have or talk about all the issues that you're interested in during this discussion hour. So please uh, interrupt and, and um, share your thoughts as we go along. So I'll just go back to, to saying um, we're talking about what we actually mean by the concept of the right to health. What does this mean in reality? Uh, so let's break this down to look at in, in the law, when we think about what the right to health means from a legal perspective, we have what we call immediately realizable obligations, as well as the concept that the right to health on the whole is something which is progressively realizable. So what do I mean by that? That sounds pretty technical. What I mean is that when governments are, um, agree to these laws, which we've spoken about, they immediately have these obligations to make sure that our rights to health are protected from things like discrimination, that we can access the right to health care um, and other components of the right to health without fearing that our nationality or our race or um, our ethnicity or our sexual orientation or gender identity or any of those factors is going to be a barrier to accessing the right to health. Those are some of the things that immediately we are protected for under law and under international law and in many countries under national law. There are many other aspects of the right to health, which are what we call progressively realizable. And these are the things where you, know, you hear many people say, well, that concept of, of health is great. And the reason why it's an aspiration that we all have the right to health is because it costs so much money. And where does it end? Where do you draw the line? Um, who gets the heart transplant if everybody needs one? Or who gets to be on kidney dialysis? All those kind of questions about who actually gets to decide who spends the resources, where the resources go, who can access every part of this process of helping us to achieve our highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. Well, that's where actually the law provides us with some of the framework for that. The law gives us some of the guidelines and the ways in which we can assess this. So uh, the international law perspective on the right to health sets out three three kind of levels of how we understand what the right to health means in terms of the obligations that governments have to uh, help um, realise the right to health. The first level is called respecting the right to health. So there's an obligation that our governments have to make sure that nobody interferes, or sorry, they don't, the government itself doesn't interfere with our right to health. So, for example, this could be like preventing access to hospitals or healthcare facilities due to excess costs, making, making them unaffordable. This is a way of not respecting or failing to respect our rights to enjoy the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. Or from a very um, practical perspective, failing to provide wheelchair ramps at hospitals to allow people um, with uh, all access issues the ability to, to actually enter the hospital facilities. So that's a really practical way that we can think about respecting the right to health means that the, the entities that are responsible for um, realising the right to health under the law, usually our governments, our national government, our local governments, our municipal councils, that kind of thing, they have an obligation to respect the right to health. The second aspect that I was talking about is the aspect of protecting the right to health. So what this means is governments have the obligation to make sure that others, we're talking here private entities like, for example, private healthcare providers, that they don't abuse our rights. So this means governments can legislate to make sure that private entities are well regulated. So it means making sure, for example, that there are laws in place to um, govern pharmaceutical companies or private hospitals or testing facilities or any of those kinds of things to make sure that 
our best interests are protected. And if you think about that, that's a big um, task that we just assume that government is going to be doing, but that governments are there to legislate to protect our interests and to regulate private industry and capitalism, etc when it needs to be regulated in order to protect individuals and vulnerable groups in society. So respect and protect. Governments not interfering with our rights and governments making sure that others don't uh, violate our rights. The third aspect is where we get to that, that thing, which is what we're talking about when we say the right to health is about progressive realisation. And this is about how governments do have an obligation to help fulfill the right to health. But it's not just about you know, saying, okay, hey, free healthcare for everybody, come on in. It's about saying, and there, there's looking at facil fulfill, facilitate, which is about giving us information about the resources available in a way that we can understand it. So providing information about healthcare facilities in um, accessible formats, whether it's language or um, braille or things like that, and ensuring that the healthcare resources, the way that they're spending the money on healthcare is um, in ways where it's adaptable to the needs of the particular communities. So looking at how can you fulfill the right to health by making sure that the resources you're currently spending are being spent in the right way. So it's not about worrying about those questions which many people ask about how can we possibly afford it? It's about looking at what are we currently spending and how can we allocate that in a way which is going to be the most effective for the communities which we're serving. We then have this concept of um, fulfil providing, meaning that we, the governments have an obligation to fulfil the right to health by providing um, facilities, access, um, the actual health care, when and financial assistance to enable us to access health care, etc., when we need it, when other parts of the system which allow us to ourselves to enjoy the right to health and access it ourselves, when those fail, there needs to be these uh, social protection flaws, safety nets for people to ensure that they can access the right to health. But if you see, that's kind of the last stage of the, the process. That's not something which you begin with thinking about how do we allocate whatever resources are needed to ensure everybody can, um, pr we can provide the right to health to every single person. No, we begin with these uh, much more uh, what we call negative obligations, which is just things like respecting. Don't step on our toes. Don't get in our way when we're trying to be healthy. Um, uh, protect us from other parties, from third parties, who may be um, either deliberately or maybe a, a side consequence, an unthought of consequence, where our rights get violated. And then finally, um, help to fulfill the, the right to help health by facilitating the, the spending of resources in ways that actually adapt to the community and providing these financial assistance or insurance programs or free access when we need it, that kind of thing. So you see it's a, a, it's a process. And this obligation to provide access uh, at a, a free level, et cetera, is progressively realisable, meaning it's not something we have to do straight away. Under the law, it's all about are our governments and our societies taking steps? Are we putting one foot in front of the other and moving forwards in terms of expanding uh, the way in which um, people are able to access the right to health? Or are we going backwards, taking what we call retrogressive measures? And the law requires that we are progressively moving forward, that we're taking steps. Not that, uh, and that it, the law says that we can't be going backwards unless we have very good reasons to be doing so. So that's what the, the legal obligations are. The other thing is a lot of people get really concerned about what does this mean in terms of to what extent do we have to pay for this? How much is it going to cost? And where do we get the money from? Now, again, the law actually looks at this. The law says that we have to use our maximum available resources. So this doesn't mean that we have to have a healthcare system which costs the earth, which we can't afford. It means that we have to look at what are the resources that we have available as a society 
in our communities, in terms of our national budget, and how do we allocate that in a way which protects human rights, which ensures that we have a healthcare system, an education system, um, a water provision system, all those different things. How do we make sure that these actually work in a way that benefit the community? What does this mean? Well, sometimes it might mean that we have to make difficult decisions, like how do we balance uh, the, those kind of parts of our budget and our economy that um, protect and promote and help realise human rights? Um, uh, and how do we balance other aspects like defence or military, which themselves also have uh, an impact on human rights in the sense that they help to protect our physical security, they help to prevent against terrorism, um, but at the same time, are they um, taking money away from healthcare systems, which we might want to prioritise? So that's some of the aspects about things that we need to think about here. Just checking, we have a question here. And um, <laughs> yeah, um, Deborah makes a really good point, which is, uh, wouldn't it be nice if we had all the money that we need for the healthcare system and it was the military that had to hold the bake sale? I completely agree. You know, if you think about it, um, uh, teachers and um, healthcare workers, uh, some, some of the people in society that we're having to think about in terms of how do we protect their salaries? How do we make sure they're being paid uh, a living wage and that they have access to um, housing and things which is affordable to them? Yet we don't have to think about that for other sectors of society. So these are some of the things that when we're looking at things from a rights-based approach, we take into account. How do we balance all of these things? This is what taking a rights-based approach to the right to health means. Balancing these things when we're looking at what do we need to do from uh, the perspective of what laws do we need? What legislative measures do we need to take? What laws do our parliamentarians need to implement in order to help realise our right to health, in order to respect, protect and fulfil the right to health? What policy measures do we want them to make? How do they balance the policy measures in the area of health versus policy measures in other areas? And what budgetary measures do we want them to make? So there's all sorts of different ways that um, are involved in realising the right to health, not just spending of money, not just laws, not just policies, but a combination of all of them. So now let's have a think about what... Um, what happens when this fails? What happens when our um, governments don't protect us or when the right to health is not being realised? And this is where we can look at another um, arm of our governance system, the courts. The courts are there to um, protect uh, us and to make sure that these rights are being implemented in a way that is most effective and most compliant with the legal standards that we have set out and agreed to. And I say we have set out and agreed to because if we're talking about representative democracies, which on the whole we are, these are things which our elective representatives, these are laws which our elective representatives have put in place and therefore they are things which through the proxy that we've given to our elected representatives, they're the laws and standards which we have agreed to. And if we don't like them, then we need to change the people who make the decisions for us to make different decisions. So the courts are there to help be that oversight mechanism in the sense of they look at these legal standards, which we've said we want, and then they look at the decisions that have been made about prioritisation, about allocation of resources, about the systems that have been established to make those decisions, what frameworks have been set up to decide who gets the heart transplant, who gets the kidney dialysis, and are those frameworks for decision making compliant with the right to health and the human rights that we're trying to protect? So that's what we have to think about when things don't go, when things don't work, we then rely on the courts to review those situations and make those decisions for us about whether or not uh, our human rights are being um, uh, realised or complied with in those situations. Now, do we have any other questions yet? Anybody got some burning issues that they want to talk about or they want me to, to address or ask about? Don't hesitate to add your, your questions or comments in the, the Facebook chat or in the chat box in Crowdcast. Um, I'm really happy to take any questions you have. Um, in the meantime, I might uh, tell you a little bit about 
how do we actually break down what does the right to health mean? Because this concept of, okay, saying the right to health is shorthand for the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, that may be a little bit more useful in terms of understanding what do we mean, but it doesn't actually help us figure out in particular instances or when we're making laws or when we're looking at laws, how does it apply? So I'm going to explain that we think about this in the human rights sector in terms of it having, uh, we call it the four A's and a Q approach. Four A's being availability, accessibility, which includes affordability, and adaptability or acceptability, and quality. So these are the different um, ways in which we try to understand what does the right to health actually mean in practice. So let's have a, a bit of a think about this, some of these things. So availability means that we have functioning facilities, it means that we actually have hospitals, we have doctor's surgeries, we have um, medicines that uh, exist, um, we have uh, a cold chain storage facilities which ensure vaccines can be um, actually sent to rural areas and um, given out. We have all these different parts of the functioning healthcare system. They exist, they're present, they work, they are available. So healthcare system has to have this aspect of availability. So both the actual facilities as well as the services. We have to have the doctors, we have to have the nurses, we have to have the ambulance staff, the, the mid-level service providers that we need. So all these different people that make up the services relating to the healthcare system. As well as what I mentioned before, these things called the underlying determinants of the right to health, meaning the education, the water and sanitation, housing, um, work, the ability to, to work, all of these kind of things are what we call the underlying determinants of the right to health. So this is part of this concept of availability. Are the facilities, the institutions, the infrastructure and the services actually available? Then we think about, are they accessible? So what do we mean by this? Are the facilities and the services actually able to be accessed? They may exist, but can everybody in society actually access them? So are they available to people without discrimination? Uh, are they safe for every member of society? Are they accessible for people with disabilities? Are they safe and accessible for people who are members of the LGBTIQ community or LGBTQIA community? Um, are they affordable? And this is where it comes into that concept also of affordability. So they may exist, but they may be financially out of reach for everybody. So I think of um, uh, accessibility as being a bit like um, the, what I think about it in terms of the physical, geographic and economic aspects. Can I physically make it into the building, into the hospital? Can I geographically have access to the available healthcare facilities? Or are the healthcare facilities only in the urban areas and I live in the rural area? And what about economically? Can I afford to access the services that are there? So that kind of helps us to really think about a whole range of different aspects about healthcare. Then we have to think about adaptability and accessibility. No, sorry, <laughs> adaptability and acceptability. I always get acceptability and accessibility um, uh, around the wrong way. So acceptability, what is acceptable? And what is adaptable? What do they mean in terms of medical services, whether it's the facilities themselves or the services that are provided or the goods that are being provided? So this means thinking about things like people with different needs. Are they language needs that are being addressed? Are they religious needs? Can I access healthcare services if I am a woman who wears a veil and I um the, do I have access to female doctors or do I have uh, the ability to maintain my religious practices while accessing the healthcare services that are available? Um, what about gender specific or um, what are the, all the different circumstances you can think of where there might be particular needs that people have in terms of making sure that health and healthcare in a society is adaptable and acceptable to the members of that society. And before we get on too many, you know, get, get distracted by too many of the, the opponents who um, critique aspects like this and say, well, 
To what extent do you go? How far do you go? When do you stop with these things? What we actually have to think about is what is adaptable and acceptable to our communities. So, of course, we need to think about who are the members of our communities? What are their specific needs? And we don't need to go so far as to thinking of every possible foreseeable um, uh, possibility of combination of how we can um, uh, make a health system functioning if we don't have those um, needs in our community. So I think some of the time when people critique aspects like this, they're really taking it to an extreme in order to try and show the ridiculousness of this, where in fact, they're not thinking about the fact that we have to look at making sure that health services and health facilities are suitable for the communities that they are there to serve. And not for, for any more than that but not for any less than that. And that's the key point. So then we also think about um, uh, quality. So what does quality mean? Uh, I think that one is a, a bit easier, but um, it usually means to, if we're thinking about the actual facilities, are they adequate to address the, the um, health needs of the community? Do we actually have the appropriate machines and hospital equipment and that kind of thing in place or ambulance services? Do we have enough of the um, emergency response services to ensure that our current community can be serviced? So for example, things like um, in some places, the emergency response services network, the actual physical infrastructure of where you call in when you dial 911 in the US or 111 elsewhere or 000 elsewhere, 122 in Switzerland, when you dial those services, does the phone um, line, do they have the capacity to take all the calls that they get? That's one of the aspects of what's the quality like of the, the service that you have. When we talk about personnel, we're talking about um, healthcare practitioners, nurses, doctors, ambulance staff, etc. Do they have the skills and training required? Um, are good standards of hygiene maintained in hospitals and uh, healthcare facilities and doctor surgeries and things? All those things are aspects to do with the quality. So we see here how if we're talking about the right to health, it's not the right to be healthy. It actually means the right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. It means things like government obligations, which are some immediate, but not all immediate, they're progressive, and they cover all aspects of respecting, protecting, and fulfilling the right to health. And in understanding what the right to health actually means when we have to break it down in terms of looking pragmatically at particular situations, we get to look and think about aspects to do with availability, accessibility, acceptability and adaptability, as well as affordability um, and quality. So we can see it's a lot more complex than just saying, do we have the right to health or not? And the answer is yes. But in terms of the critiques that we come up against, uh, we have a lot more information now to be able to come back at some of those critiques and see, well, what are we actually talking about when we're talking about the right to health? I'm going to just look at one last aspect since I don't see any more questions yet. So I'm just going to look at one more aspect, which is when we think about taking a human rights based approach to the right to health. When we take a human rights based approach to anything, this means something. This, this means that we look at a certain set of principles and we apply these principles when looking at all aspects of the, the system, how we access it, what quality it is, etc. What are those principles? For those who are following along in my course on how to stand up for human rights in the new dystopian era, um, and Deb has posted a link to this in the comments above on the Facebook page, um, it, what it means to have a human rights-based approach and what the principles that we apply with this approach, it means thinking about panther. Now, I don't mean a black panther, you know, an animal sitting in the zoo or out in the wild. I mean the acronym panther. And this is a really useful way of thinking about all sorts of things when it comes to human rights. So these are the main principles that we apply when we take a human rights based approach. So Panther means participation, accountability, non-discrimination, transparency, human dignity, empowerment, and uh, the R talks
talks about the rule of law and what that really means is um, adherence to our applicable, applicable legal standards. So human rights standards, standards that are protected by human rights law. So let's go through that a bit more slowly and, and unpack it a bit more. Participation, what does that mean? This one I think is a really big one. Um, participation means that if we're taking a human rights based approach, we get to participate in decisions that impact us. Yeah, thanks Deb for spelling that out. So these are the human rights, the, the principles of a human rights based approach. And we think about this in terms of the acronym PANTHER. Participation is the first one. So participation means that when we, uh, when there are decisions made, we get to have a say in these. Now, if we think about the healthcare system and what's happening in the US at the moment, there's a lot of people that are not happy about this. And in terms of the repeal of the Affordable Care Act, there have been people participating in town halls all over the place. But we're seeing that the representatives are not necessarily listening. And if we look at this and say, well, is this a human rights based approach? Well, it might be possible to say people have been participating um, in the decision making process. We've been calling senators, um, you know, and, and representatives. There's been that engagement, but we don't like the decision. Now, just because we don't like the decision doesn't mean the process wasn't done according to a human rights based approach. But at the same time, just because we've uh, spoken just because we've shared our voice doesn't mean our voice has been listened to and this is where I think there's a difference between participation and consultation a lot of times you hear talk about we've consulted with uh, constituencies or with uh, the concerned communities or with local groups but that doesn't necessarily mean that the local groups have participated in the decision making process so from a human rights perspective this aspect of participation is really important the next aspect in our PANTHER acronym, so PANTHER, P-A-N-T-H-E-R, so the P is participation, A is accountability. Now this goes right back to the beginning of this webinar where I was talking about the concept of the right to health being a legal construct. And what that means is there's accountability mechanisms. So we have this process of being able to go to court, to check, to use the court as a check on are the, at the human rights standards which our governments have committed to implementing and complying with, are these being adhered to in this particular instance or when it comes to the policy or law as a whole? So accountability is a really important part of looking at health from a human rights perspective because it is a legal system, it's a legal framework and with a legal framework comes accountability. I'm going to whip through the others a bit faster because I see that we're nearly out of time. Um, so the N in Panther is about non-discrimination and equality. So it's just an N, but that's the beginning for us for meaning non-discrimination and equality. And of course, this is pretty obvious. It means that if we're looking at anything from a human rights perspective, we have to look at it from the position of, are we implementing our laws, our policies, our budgetary measures, in the way that ensures non-discrimination and equality. And that means for everybody, for every group in society, for every um, group at risk or, or marginalised person. The T in Panther talks about transparency. And transparency goes hand in hand with participation because how can we have uh, participation if we don't have transparency? How can we participate in the decision-making process if, they're, if the, those who are making the decisions are not transparent about what they're making decisions about. If they're not transparent about the budget, how can we have a say in that's not how we want the funds to be allocated? If they're not transparent about the laws that are being put in place, how can we participate in the lawmaking process? So transparency is a really fundamental aspect there. The H in Panther talks about one of the, the things which really is the, the underlying um, foundation for the entire human rights project, and that is human dignity. At the heart, human rights is about protecting human dignity. And this is what the human rights project uh, is based on, this concept of human dignity. How do we think about each issue that we're looking at from the perspective of ensuring human dignity is protected? 
this is a really complex issue and I don't want to, I'll just leave it at, at this, just saying human dignity, because I think this is something which uh, is a really interesting aspect to think about. How do we think about laws, policies, budgets from the perspective of protection of human dignity? The E in Panther is about empowerment. How, do, how does our health system, if we're looking at from a right to health perspective, how does it foster empowerment? How does it lead to empowerment? How does it help empowerment? How does it impair empowerment? Empowerment is a really important aspect of this human rights based approach. So thinking about how it impacts on empowerment is really important. And then the R means the rule of law, meaning looking at legal standards and compliance with international legal standards. So does our national um, legislation, uh, the way that we allocate our budgets or make our policies, do they comply with international legal standards and what we call the rule of law? So those are the human rights principles which we apply when we think about a human rights based approach. And keeping in mind, we keep the courts as a safety net here. So let's uh, kind of go back a, or go forward a step and go back to answering the questions that we raised at the very beginning. What does this mean for healthcare? What does this mean in terms of health insurance? What does it mean in terms of universal healthcare? Uh, does it mean that we have to have universal healthcare? Is it necessary? Um, what does it mean in terms of uh, insurance schemes? Well, the easy answer to that is it means that, it's not actually so easy, we have to go back and look at does, uh, is universal healthcare something that's required? If we look at a human rights based approach and that panther approach of participation, accountability, non-discrimination and equality, transparency, human dignity, empowerment and the um, compliance with legal standards, rule of law, does that necessitate a universal healthcare? Well, not necessarily. Universal healthcare can be a really great way of achieving that. But we have to think about those things like affordability, accessibility, adaptability and acceptability um, and quality. How can we ensure and maintain all of those aspects? Can it be done without universal health care? Well, in a way, universal health care is just the, the name for making sure that health care is available to all without discrimination, right? without financial discrimination, without discrimination on the grounds of any of those criteria we're used to thinking about when we think about discrimination. So when we're thinking about health insurance schemes, do we need an Affordable Care Act? Do, does a, a different version of a Health Care Act actually comply with the right to health? Does it? How does it comply with the right to health? Does it help to realise the right to health? What we need to look at is, does it comply with those aspects of respecting, protecting and fulfilling the right to health? Does it cover all of those areas of availability, acceptability, access, adaptability, affordability and quality? And does it allow for human rights principles to be honoured? Does it allow for and in the, the process of putting it in place, does it comply with concepts like participation? accountability, doesn't have a system of accountability where if things are going wrong, we can access the court system, etc. What about transparency? Did we, was the process transparent enough that we got to participate fully in making decisions in about things that affect us and our lives? Empowerment, does the system that we have of healthcare and the insurance that helps health healthcare to be more affordable to us, is it empowering for all the members of society? And does it comply with international legal standards? So I know it may sound like I've left the key questions till the very end and only just answered them and in the, that maybe um, in a very shorthand way. I answered them by all the things that we spoke about before, understanding what the right to health actually means and what it's made up of and how we analyze it helps us to understand how we analyze what do we need in terms of legislation? What do we need in terms of insurance schemes? And how do we protect our right to health when it's being threatened or violated by governments whose policies are not necessarily in our best interest? 
Now, let's see if we have any questions. Might just uh, go for, for however long we, we have any questions coming up here. Doesn't look like we have that many questions here, which um, is fine. Uh, I think um, one of the, the questions that I, I was anticipating or thinking about when it comes to looking at instances like um, healthcare insurance and legislation about healthcare insurance, particularly in countries like uh, the US, one of the telltale signs that, that we're looking at something, when we're looking at something from a human rights perspective about hmm, maybe this isn't 100% compliant with a right to health approach, is looking at things like how does the legislation protect groups like women and children? How does it look at women's reproductive health rights or women's health rights in general? And are these treated differently to the health needs of men? And of course, in a way, they should be treated differently. There are different needs and these need to be taken into account. That falls under that banner of adaptability that we spoke about before. But are women getting equal access to the health care that they need? Is it equally affordable for them to be able to address the, the health care needs that they have? So it comes back to that affordability aspect. And then also looking at things like uh, with the, the Affordable Care Act in the US, we saw that some of the, the legislation coming through on the very last moment was to look at things like pre-existing conditions and making um, pre-existing conditions okay for some people, as in the um, decision makers themselves, the um, members of uh, the our elected representatives, but not for all people not for many women um, in particular and many others in society who have pre-existing conditions. So if we're looking at those human rights principles that I spoke about before, about looking at non-discrimination and equality, and if we're looking at uh, um, the, the four A's and a Q that I spoke about, making sure that adaptability and accessibility, availability um, and acceptability, that the right to health is all of those things, then some of the decisions that were made about the Affordable Care Act, about the repeal of the Affordable Care Act and putting that into place, probably fail some of those tests that we spoke about. So that's when we're thinking about is the legislation and policies and the budgetary measures that our governments have put in place when it comes to the right to health, are these compliant with human rights? Those are the things we need to look at, those things that we spoke about during the, the beginning parts of this uh, webinar, looking at um, what is the right to health? What does it actually mean? What does it comprise of? And what are the principles that we can apply when we're thinking about it? That's what we need to look at. And that's how we use that in our advocacy as well. It's really important to think about how do we use a human rights perspective in our advocacy? We can use it by looking at the fact that these are legal standards. These are protected by laws that our governments have signed on to, that our governments have agreed to and have said that they will implement on our behalf. These are not aspirations or goals that we can simply dismiss as a case of, well, they'd do it if they could afford it, but since they can't, we can let them off. It's about looking at all those aspects of are they using the maximum available resources to take progressive steps to improve the health systems for everybody in society? And how can we use those laws and what the laws mean, how we interpret them in the advocacy that we have? Begins with knowledge, begins with understanding what they are and, and um, what they include and what they involve, which is hopefully a little bit about what you've got today um, through this. So I just want to double check that... Um, uh, if there's anything else on Facebook, no, or um, if there's anything else in our uh, Crowdcast chat, I want to say a big, big thank you to everybody who joined us today, to people who joined us on Facebook Live, hello and thank you, and to those who joined the Crowdcast, to those who are watching the, the video after the, the live event, thank you so much for taking the time to watch and listen and learn and contribute, I really appreciate it. And I would love your feedback and ideas for topics that we um, uh, do for our next monthly discussion hour. I'll try to keep it under an hour next time. I'm almost 10 minutes over this time. Um, that was due to some of the, the setup delays at the beginning. Very big thank you to Deb, who's been monitoring the, the comments and the chats and helping me with those. And uh, another note to our sponsors, which is many of you who contribute individually to the work of the Global Human Rights Group and to, to me. Thank you so much. And we look forward to you joining us next time. Don't hesitate to add questions in the comments um, on Facebook or write to me privately and we'll get back to you with some of the answers to these. And in the meantime, we'll see you on Facebook 
and join us in th uh, on the third Thursday of June for the next topic. Thanks, everyone. Bye.